Hello everybody and welcome to my complete Eclipse guide. For those who don't know, Eclipse difficulty is baseline monsoon but with stackable purely negative modifiers which you gain after each successful run. The only way to successfully complete a run is to kill Mithrix. You cannot obliterate nor use any artifacts to aid you in your run. Also, the successful runs are tracked separately on each survivor, meaning you could be on Eclipse 6 as Huntress but only Eclipse 4 on Commando. Currently, there are a total of 8 modifiers. There very well may be more if you're watching this guide in the future, but the information I'll give should apply regardless of which level you are on and or how many there are in total. If you're looking only for a specific section, hover over the video now or look in the description below for timestamps. And before I start spewing information at you left and right, there is a completely uncut Eclipse 8 run with live commentary linked below. It's for those of you that find it more useful to actually observe what's going on in real time. There is also a link to my complete Mithrix guide as you'll have to be very comfortable with the fight to progress through Eclipse. All right, let's dive in. I'll start here by explaining exactly what each Eclipse modifier does individually so that I can then go over general strategy as a whole. Eclipse 1, while potentially scary at first glance, simply causes you and any allies, so drones, beetle guards and such, to begin each stage with half of your health missing. It is not a permanent reduction and you're able to leech, heal, or regen your health back to its full amount. As this is the first modifier you encounter on your Eclipse journey, it will likely throw you off at the first few runs, but once you realize that a single healing item completely nullifies it, E1 becomes nothing more than a blood shrine that scammed you. Eclipse 2 is self-explanatory. Your teleporter is half its usual size. Now, you may be thinking, gee, half size ain't too bad at all. And then you'll quickly figure out just how noticeable it is when a sphere loses half of its area. E2 can make your stage 4 and especially stage 5 teleporter fights extremely stressful as you'll have to kite around the multitudes of elite brass contraptions, elder lemurians, parents, and such with only half of a usual space. Eclipse 3 is also self-explanatory. Fall damage is doubled and can completely kill you instead of always leaving you with at least one HP. Basically, get ready to cancel your momentum when falling from heights greater than a few commandos and be very, very wary of the edges of each stage. There is a bit more to cover with this modifier, but I'll save it for the general strategy section. E4, like E1, can potentially be scary at first, but thankfully it only affects enemy movement speed and not their attacks or abilities. Enemies with exclusively ranged attacks, like wisps and brass contraptions, are simply more nimble, and ones such as beetles and parents can catch up to you quicker, but otherwise remain largely the same. E5 cuts all healing you receive and in half. Region, leads, shrines, drones, no matter the source, it's halved. Think of it as an inverse Reju frag. E6 lowers gold gains from kills and only kills by 20%. You'll find this modifier annoying when killing enemies that are already on the stage when you arrive. Normally these guys only drop a fraction of their usual amount, but with E6, they will literally grant zero gold on stage one and even stage two occasionally. Super frustrating. E7 is quite the potent modifier. 50% cooldown reduction essentially translates to double attack speed for everything. The only redeeming factor about E7 is that it does not affect the animation speed of attacks, so golems will still take the full amount of time to charge their lasers, contraptions will queue up their spiky balls at the same rate, so on and so forth. Also, the travel speed of all projectiles remains the same. There's no getting smacked by a Mach 10 contraption ball. The difference is that the recovery time, the time from when an enemy's attack ends to when it can begin again, is halved, leading to double the overall attack rate. Finally, Eclipse 8. Permanent damage. Kind of. It's exactly exact function is as follows. A percentage of your maximum health is removed based on 40% of all damage taken. The black teardrop icon above your health indicates your current percent of HP lost. One stack is 1%. Any HP removed by E8 occurs via the Curse debuff, the same method used by Shape Glass and Tonic Afflictions, which means you cannot, under any circumstances, restore it. However, the E8 debuff is reset entirely upon reaching a new stage. As soon as you teleport out, all stacks of the Black Teardrop are removed and you're reset back to your usual HP amount. Finally, for the debuff to add a stack in the first place, 40% of the damage taken must exceed 1% of your non-debuffed health. That last line is quite the loaded sentence, so allow me to use an example to better explain. First, a very clear example of the E8 debuff at work. My non-debuffed or max HP is 200. Remember, the debuff only triggers when 40% of the damage you take is more than 1% of max HP. In this case, 1% of my HP is a whopping 2. I take 180 damage. The debuff then looks at that 180 to see if 40% of the value is greater than 2. 40% of 180. Yeah, hmm, carry the 6, and mm -hmm, yep, I think that just may be a little more than 2. As a result, I I get debuffed and lose max HP. In this case, the damage taken was 180 and 40% of that is 72. So I lose 72 of my 200 or 36% of my HP, as is displayed by the black teardrop icon. The math checks out. Now, here's an example where I take a little less damage. I still have
have 200 max HP, but now instead of 180 damage, I take a measly five. And oh, would you look at that? No debuff to be seen. Again, 1% of my health is two and 40% of five is exactly two, not greater than. Therefore, the EA debuff is not applied as 40% of the damage taken did not exceed 1% of my HP. Now that you know exactly what each Eclipse modifier does, let's talk about the approach you should take to have the greatest odds of tackling Eclipse difficulty as a whole. Everything you hear in this video is catered towards Eclipse 8 specifically, as you'll be under the effects of all modifiers simultaneously, and hey, you may as well prep for what's to come even if you haven't reached E8 yet. First and foremost, Eclipse runs should be done at stage 6, period, end of story. Your sole goal is to win a run, which again is only done by killing Mithrix, so you need to go straight to Mithrix upon completing the teleporter on stage. Five. You are shooting yourself in the foot if you choose the loop. Think of it like this. Do you have an absolutely insane run with crazy good RNG? Awesome. Go to Mythrix and annihilate him. Do you have an average run with some okay items and stand a decent chance of taking him down? Cool. Go to Mythrix and play it carefully. Do you have an abysmal run with only war banners, poglyphs, and frost relics? Well, you sure as heck ain't gonna make it through another loop with that stuff. YOLO straight to Mythrix and pray that the lunar cauldrons along the way hook you up. Even with amazing loot, if you choose to loop, you run the chance of something silly like this happening. And no! The pots, dude! The pots! Are you kidding me? I'll say it one last time. Do not loop your Eclipse runs, okay? Okay. Another big topic to cover is time spent per stage. The short answer is, it depends. As for the long answer, well, in a normal run where your goal is to go as far as you can, spending less time per stage in the first loop is ideal as it grants you the best ratio of risk to reward. <laughs> risk to reward, get it? Even if you get subpar loot, your enemies won't have scale too high and thus be pretty easy to take down regardless. Eclipse runs are obviously not normal runs, therefore the same golden rule of four to four and a half minutes per stage doesn't necessarily apply. Across the many, many Eclipse runs that I've done, I've spent under 20 minutes total to reach stage five, but I've also spent easily over 30 and sometimes 40. It just depends. As I've been saying in my videos literally since I started making them, understanding the context of a run is extremely important to having a successful one. What I mean by that is, your personal experience should tell you when it is and when it is not a good idea to go and loop that extra chest all the way across the stage. You may pull out that much needed extra tri-tip dagger or energy drink, or you could pull out a bungus and waste your time completely. You need to understand that balance and risk versus reward in order to have successful runs. Eclipse simply pushes that concept to the absolute max. That being said, if you can afford to spend less time per stage, as in you've done all the judgment calls necessary, it's never a bad idea to keep your pace up. Going into the the Eclipse mods themselves now, most are actually not that big of a deal. Once you do a couple runs with half of your HP missing at the start of each stage or getting 20% less gold per kill, they become the norm and you kind of forget about them. Heck, even Eclipse 7, double enemy attack speed isn't that big of a deal and simply tests how well your target acquisition skills are. So long as you take down the largest threats first, it really doesn't change your gameplay up too much, if at all. The three most impactful modifiers, as in the ones you'll constantly be aware of and have to play around, are E2, E3, and E8. That's half size teleporter, lethal fall damage, and permanent damage respectively. E2 is a non-issue for the first few stages, but once you start getting hordes of enemies spawning around stage 4 and especially stage 5, you'll have to play outside of the teleporter for 90% of fights. There is no way around it. Unless you have a way to quickly clear the boss and initial enemy spawns, like a Preon or a Samarang, there are simply far too many things flying at you to comfortably stay inside of the TP zone while dealing with them all. Also, even if the boss is dead and you're in a holding pattern, taking out whatever spawns while the TP finishes, you still run the risk of being overwhelmed by hermit crab or mini mushroom shots from all the way across the map. If things are getting dicey, do not be afraid to leave the teleporter zone far, far behind you. Simple as that. Eclipse 3. Lethal fall damage. On one survivor, it's entirely a non-issue. <laughs> but for the most part, it's a pretty big inconvenience and for a few, it's a straight up death sentence. Survivors that have an innate method of slowing momentum do not suffer nearly as many consequences as those who do not. Commando, Huntress, Artificer, Mercenary, Acrid, and Rex each have a way to stop or heavily mitigate fall damage, but Multi, Engineer, and Captain have none. If you are playing one of those three and get smacked into the air by a Magma Worm, whoops, there goes your run. Better yet, if you manage to completely kill Mythrix but have no items or equipment to mitigate fall damage, whoops, there goes your run. The final area is high enough that if your fall is not slowed in some way, you will die from the Eclipse 3 modifier. Hopefully this is addressed in the future because it's kind of annoying to require a specific item or equipment to get a successful run in. Luckily, there are plenty of ways to mitigate and entirely stop fall damage from occurring. I'll cover these methods in the next best items section. Finally, Eclipse 8. Honestly, unless you make some major mistakes, I'm talking big oopsies, perma damage is irrelevant until stage 5. If you're playing your run right,
right, you should have enough damage regardless of your loot and survivor choice to deal with the major threats before you get overwhelmed. And if the major threats are dead, you're left with the occasional tickle damage, as I like to call it, and nothing else. These would be lesser wisp shots, imp bleeds, the occasional Lemurian attack, so on and so forth. Because the debuff is reset after each stage, you can easily afford to lose 10, 20, even 30% of your max HP before it actually becomes noticeable, and once you're done with the stage, boop, it's back to normal. I should mention here that if the curse debuff exceeds 10% of your max HP, your one-shot protection is removed entirely, but it's not that big of a deal due to how short the eclipse runs are. So long as you're not at a snail's pace, you won't have to worry about a single hit killing you outright, even from Mithrix, except for the big hammer slam that he does, but that thing hits twice and you're dead if you get hit anyway. Stage 5, and obviously the final stage, are the two times where Eclipse 8 matters most. Stage 5, because the enemy types are highly lethal, Elder Lemurians, Brass Contraptions, Hordes of Wisps and Mushrooms, etc. And remember, you've got to make it through the half-sized teleporter event while dealing with them all. You're bound to make some mistakes and take damage, and if not kept in check, the E8 modifier can spiral out of control in the blink of an eye. Stage 6, because, well, you don't get any more recess once you're there, and every enemy does some nutty damage. Each mistake you make adds up very quickly. You should be extremely conscious of what's around you on these stages, and never underestimate an enemy, as even a single Lesser Wisp could spell the end of your run. Let's talk items and equipment. Are there certain ones that prove much more useful in Eclipse than in normal runs? Yes, there absolutely are. I'll start here with the two that were by far the most impactful during all of my Eclipse runs. Shaped Glass and Transcendence. I seriously cannot overstate their usefulness. Double damage from Shaped Glass is so much more valuable than losing half of your HP when enemies are moving and attacking at a highly accelerated rate. That, coupled with Eclipse 8, means that the name of the game is Kill or Be Killed, as if it wasn't that already. Also because, again, your runs are so short relative to normal ones, there's no guarantee that you have a decent amount of damage items. Maybe you just have a couple pairs of crit or a wedding band or two. Well, gee, picking up a shaped glass is going to feel like night and day for your overall DPS. If you've never played with glass or struggled to keep yourself alive whenever you take it, start practicing. I can't tell you how many of my runs were saved by glass's damage. And transcendence. Eclipse means short runs. Short runs means less items. Less items means less healing, and less healing means greater risk of getting overwhelmed with small hits. Eclipse also means Eclipse 3. E three means fall damage. Do you see now? Transcendence is the key. Are you worried about dying from lack of healing? Tired of spawning in every stage of half health? Wish you'd stop losing 20% of your HP by falling from a height no greater than a couple Tyler ones? Transcendence. Jokes aside, I am being serious. Transcendence is absolutely insane for Eclipse runs. No more fall damage, no more need for healing, just retreat from combat for 7 seconds and bam, full HP. And yup, the Eclipse 1 modifier only applies to regular HP, not shields, so you'll spawn into every stage with full HP immediately as well. That's just icing on the cake. If you see a Transcendence and you are not playing Rex, you take it. No questions asked. Yes, even if you have a Rejuve Rack, Cap Crit, and 3 Sights, you take Transcendence. For commons, Repulsion Armor is the single most important item to get early on. Remember that whole Eclipse 8 example, if the damage you take isn't high enough, the debuff doesn't even apply. Getting literally just one repulsion armor entirely negates the damage from Lesser Wisps on the first two stages. If you can manage to get 3 to 5 repulsions, you won't have to worry about a thing until stage 4. It's crazy how good they are. Mobility is also extremely important. Enemies move and attack faster, remember? You better get some energy drinks, gold hooves, wax quills, and hopu feathers then. Speaking of hopu feathers, fall damage. There's a solution for it. Now, a single feather is not always going to save you. If you try to jump out of the way of something and then are knocked into the air or off the map for whatever reason, there is no way to stop what's coming next. Therefore, one of your top priorities, and definitely your top priority on multi-engineer and captain, is to find a consistent way to stop fall damage. As I've already said, transcendence. You also have Hopu Feathers, the <coughs> Head Stomper, <coughs> gross, ugh, and the Milky Chrysalis or Volcanic Egg Equipments. And as a very, very last resort, and my gosh, let me make it clear how much of a last resort this is, Teddy Bears. If all else fails and you've just finished stage 5, made it to the cauldrons on stage 6, and you don't see a Hopu feather, well, then you better YOLO off of Mithrix's arena with some teddy bears. If anything, it'll be some great content. Another item that is far more useful in Eclipse are armor-piercing rounds. Mithrix is a boss. That's all that needs to be said about that one. If you find a printer, you should immediately look for a scrapper and turn anything but your most essential damage and mobility items into armor piercing rounds. The more, the merrier. Before I move on to the survivor details, I'll quickly mention a few items that normally are very good items, but here on Eclipse aren't that great. Guillotines, ukuleles, and will of the wisps. You're going straight to stage 6 and ending your run. The Mithrix fight has no need for screen-wide AoE capabilities and really no need for AoE at all. You won't see tons of elites throughout your run, so guillotines aren't nearly as useful 
helpful. You won't get tons of enemies in general on your screen as you're only doing the first loop, so ukuleles and wisps aren't that great either. And for all of them, they have zero effect on the Mythrix fight itself. You are much better off taking another Hopu Feather, Wax Quell, ATG, Band, whatever it may be, than taking a single one of those items. But of course, as with everything, context may dictate that a single ukulele or wisp is required to deal with whatever situation you are in. These items will still do their respective jobs just as well as usual, it's just there are way less jobs for them to do in the first place. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's now move on to survivor specific information. I'll start here with a brief tier list for those of you who aren't too picky about who you play and want some insight on which survivors are more consistent than others. In poor consistency, we have Engineer, Mercenary, and Rex. In average consistency, we have Commando, Artificer, Acrid, and Captain. Finally, in high consistency, we have Huntress, Loader, and Multi. Let's start at the bottom with Engineer. Engineer has no innate mobility, poor methods of dealing with flying enemies, a wonky primary attack that makes hitting nimble enemies a nightmare, can't quickly deal with tons of threats, and has no way to prevent fall damage. Even with some great items, if you don't have the right amount of defense and mobility or a metric butt ton of damage, you'll quickly be overwhelmed and especially get wrecked by Mythrix. You absolutely need a way to deal with fall damage, so getting a Hopu Feather, Head Stomper, Transcendence, Chrysalis, or an Egg are essential. Don't expect your turrets to be alive at all during the Mythrix fight because a Shockwave will literally one-shot them. Engineer definitely struggles a bit on Eclipse. Next, Mercenary. The biggest thing to decide is whether to take Eviscerate or Slicing Winds. Slicing gives you another exposed prop and some actual range to deal with threats, but Eviscerate gives more consistent DPS, mobility, and of course, some iframes. I started my mercenary runs with Slicing Winds, but after changing back to Eviscerate, it honestly felt a whole lot better. But experiment yourself to find out what suits your playstyle best. Also, Visions of Heresy is a no-brainer pickup on the mercenary. Why bother staying in melee range constantly versus highly lethal enemies for the occasional exposed proc, when you can just sit back and enjoy crits, bleeds, and ATG procs just like everybody else. Next, Rex. Note the two loadouts, one for Eclipse, eight specifically and one for everything beforehand. The sole reason Rex has poor consistency is because sadly the perma damage modifier does affect his self damaging abilities. To say playing Rex on E8 is frustrating is quite the understatement. However, on all Eclipse levels before eight, Rex is just as powerful as he normally is, save for half as much healing once you hit E5. Still, he's nowhere near as painful to play than on Eclipse eight. Moving up to average consistency, starting with Commando. Commando has always been pretty good in the early game. It's really once you get past the first loop where his kit begins to falter without the necessary items to back it up. Since you're only going to Mythrix, your odds of reaching and defeating him are pretty good with the commando, mostly due to his mobility and the ability to deal with singular threats relatively quickly. Look for some bleed and some attack speed, and all that's left is to hope you don't get an overloading horde of many on stage 5. Next, Artificer. While at first glance the Artificer may seem like one of the best survivors for Eclipse with high early game damage, the ability to negate fall damage, and her multiple freezes and executes, which do work on Mythrix, I place her here as having average consistency because man does she suck at dealing with multiple high threat targets. She's great at dealing with multiple low threat targets like regular Lemurians and imps, but once you get more than a couple brass contraptions flying around with an imp overlord or a blazing parent chasing you, yeah, everything can accumulate very quickly and spell the end of your run. Which is exactly the reason for our next survivor being here, Acrid. Our good boy Doggo is definitely the easiest survivor to kill Mythrix on. Tap him once with your poison and maintain it every few seconds for the easiest boss kill of your entire life. However, try dealing with hordes of enemies quickly and yeah, you can't do it. Every little bit of damage adds up permanently, and being able to deal with large groups of enemies quickly is a necessity. Acrid is absolutely terrible at killing stuff fast, hence the average spot. Like the mercenary, Visions of Heresy is also a no-brainer choice on Acrid, as his melee attack is completely obsolete by stage 4 anyway. Next, Captain. Captain is the polar opposite of Acrid. He's great at quickly dealing with high and low threats, but absolutely zero mobility, nor a way to deal with fall damage. It's fun blowing through stages 1 through 4 with not a care in the world, but once reality sets in on stage 5, and especially the Mythrix fight, you better buckle up for the bumpy ride ahead. Finally, moving into high consistency, starting with Huntress. Insane mobility, great AoE, and pretty solid single target on top, sign me right up. The reason I don't recommend Flurry over Strafe is because your runs are simply too short to guarantee getting decent crit chance. Strafe is so much better than Flurry early on, and as I've said many times in this guide, dealing with threats quickly is a must. The faster rate at which you'll be killing Lesser Wisps and Lemurians with Strafe is worth taking it alone. Next, Multi. The only reason and multi is here is because of just how stupidly strong double rebar is. If you're watching this video in the future where double rebar got nerfed, then I'd recommend nail gun and rebar and have to put him in poor consistency. However, as multi currently stands with his rebar shenanigans, you get a free run 90% of the time. Finally, loader. I mean, it's the loader.
loader. She's always obliterated the early game. Not like the portal, but you know, the actual meaning of the world. Okay, never mind. And surprise, surprise, Eclipse runs are basically all early game. That, coupled with the complete negation of fall damage, means she is easily one of, if not the best survivor for Eclipse difficulty. All right, and that pretty much covers everything I wanted to talk about on Eclipse difficulty. To briefly summarize, never loop your runs. Always take the Mythrix fight on stage six. Be especially aware of E2, E3, and E8 as they have the largest impact on your runs. Prioritize repulsion armor above everything on the first few stages. About four stacks should be enough. Transcendence is a free run. Shape glass is very strong as well. Finally, if context dictates it, spend as much time as you need to get as powerful as possible. Don't worry about the golden rule of time spent per stage. And that's it. What are your thoughts? Are you rocking Slice and Wins Mercenary and want to tell me just how busted it is? Let me know with a like or dislike on the video and a comment below. You can check out my stream at twitch.tv slash wooldygaming and consider joining our Discord server as well. Thank you for watching.